Welcome to the 3030 Health Podcast. The following discussion is for education and entertainment. It is not intended to diagnose or treat disease. Please do not apply any of this information without first discussing it with your doctor. Here is your host, Dr. Ruiz. Hello, everyone. Super excited for my guest today. My guest today is Angie Alt. Angie is a nutritional therapy consultant, certified health coach, and author of the Alternative Autoimmune Cookbook and co-author of the Autoimmune Wellness Handbook. She is the creator of SAT2 AIP in 6, an online coaching program that has helped thousands of people on the path to wellness, teaching them how to transition their diets and lifestyle over a six-week period. Angie also partnered with Dr. Connie Jetty, director of the Inflammatory Bowel Disease Program at Scripps Clinic in San Diego, to run a medical study entitled Efficacy of the Autoimmune Protocol Diet for Inflammatory Bowel Disease, which had amazing results published in 2017. In 2015, Angie partnered with AutoimmunePaleo.com founder Mickey Trescott. Mickey and Angie transitioned AutoimmunePaleo.com to AutoimmuneWellness.com reflecting their vision for AIP as a mainstream option for those with autoimmune disease. If you like the information shared in this podcast, please share it with your family and friends. It really makes a difference. Thank you, and I hope you enjoyed the show. Hello, everyone. Super excited to be here with Angie Alt. And Angie is an expert on the autoimmune paleo protocol. And she has some cool information about a recent study that she helped publish. But before we begin, we're an interview. Angie, how are you? And can you tell us your hero story? Oh, wow. Okay. So a hero story. I guess I don't think about it that way. I'm great. It's really great to be here. Thank you for having me on. I guess uh, my story kind of started... I mean, really now, when I look in hindsight, I realize that my story started um, probably about 17 years ago when my daughter was born. You know, a lot of women begin their journeys with autoimmune disease, with pregnancy or childbirth and all those big hormonal shifts. Um, Sometimes that is the trigger. And that is definitely the case for me. A few months after she was born, I started to develop um, symptoms of my first autoimmune disease, which is a skin disorder called lichen sclerosis. And I got that diagnosis relatively quickly, which is kind of unusual for people with autoimmune disease. Sometimes it's hard to pin our our diseases down, and it takes a long time to diagnose. But I got that one pretty quickly. But what the doctor didn't tell me was that it was an autoimmune disease and that having one autoimmune disease meant I was at risk for developing more. So, you know, I was a young mom and I was a busy mom and I just said, oh, you know, whatever, I've got this this thing. And I went about my life and kind of did the conventional approach to dealing with it. And not long after I started to develop symptoms of what I now know were celiac disease. It took another 11 years before I was finally diagnosed with celiac disease. And I got very, very ill during that time. By the time I actually got diagnosed, um, you know, my small intestine was very damaged from celiac. I wasn't really able to absorb uh, nutrients properly from my diet. And I was very malnourished because of that. You know, um, celiac disease is kind of a disease of malnourishment. And I was living overseas at the time with my husband in West Africa. And a lot of scary things started happening. You know, we don't realize that all the nutrients we're taking in, all the vitamins and minerals, once they become depleted and we're malnourished, we start to have a cascade of other health problems. And it seems all unrelated, but it was all related to the health of my gut. And um, I started having a lot of scary medical problems that you really can't address very well um, in a developing country that doesn't have a very good healthcare system. I ended up going through three medical evacuations, which were very scary. Um, One of them was during a political crisis in the country. So it was really complicated and stressful. And I had a lot of, you know, mixed emotions about that situation. Finally, I came home to the United States and I started seeing doctor after doctor. And everybody thought I probably had a tropical disease because I had come from West Africa. I, you know, I was even misdiagnosed with malaria. Finally, I saw a gastroenterologist, and after doing a a bunch of different tests, she figured out that I had celiac disease. In between all of that, I was also diagnosed with endometriosis. So I have three different um, autoimmune diseases. Endometriosis is kind of one of those maybe it's autoimmune diseases, and it changed my life. 
I, I it was not even on my radar that celiac disease could be something that was wrong. And um, having to change my diet just changed everything. Not very long after that diagnosis, I discovered the autoimmune protocol. Um, I learned about it from a sentence in Rob Wolf's first book. And I said, okay, that's me. I have three different autoimmune diseases. I better try this protocol. I didn't want to, <laughs> but I went for it. And within three days, I experienced some really major changes. And within six weeks, my gluten antibodies dropped by half. By six months, it was like I had a new body. And by a year, I decided to change everything, including my career and my life to focus on helping other people adopt this protocol. And that's exactly what I mean by a hero story. You know, <laughs> and, 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 and the coolest thing is that you have not ended it. So it's still developing. So that's amazing. So a uh, couple of things, you know, so we think about, oh, you were living in West Africa. So you were probably eating a pretty lean, undercaloric, maybe even uh, food. And it was probably pretty traditional. Yeah. Uh, you yeah. know, there, there is a lot of uh, talk in, you know, this past year and maybe a little bit before the year started. There has been more noise or we've been talking more about how calories do matter. And there's a lot of people talking about like, well, you know, maybe grains are not that bad. And and the problem is that the people that are the loudest are the people that are the healthiest. And as you get healthier, you get a little bit more uh, latitude towards your choices and you get to cheat more. And, you know, so you were eating a pretty traditional diet for the area. You were probably a little bit under caloric. If you were eating like a traditional diet, and you were not over consuming processed carbohydrates or processed or junk food. Why were you sick? Uh, the big reasons that I was sick is because um, I had a very damaged intestine and I didn't realize that I had active celiac disease. So I couldn't absorb anything I was bringing in anyway. Like you said, it was probably a little under caloric and I don't particularly believe that that's smart for anyone, especially if you're dealing with autoimmune disease. You know, the healing process for any disease is a very like nutrient hog process, right? You have to be taking in enough for your body to produce the energy it needs to not only just do the baseline functions, but to then even heal. It's a difference between do you want to look good in a bikini or do right. you want to be a healthy human being? And, and I see this in my practice. You know, we see people that have been doing the paleo thing for six years and they are so sick and tired of being sick and tired. And, and now they're coming to us with like, OK, now what? And there's a spectrum. You know, you can start with, OK, well, let's eliminate wheat, dairy and eggs and eggs tend to be pretty healthy, but for some people, that might be the thing that's setting them off. And they're like, but I've tried that already. And that's when I go into, okay, well, now let's do an AIP protocol. And there is no cheating. And this is your health. And lo and behold, three weeks, I'm not talking about months. I'm talking about weeks, three weeks, four weeks later, boom. And uh, I, I, I patient, you know, with uh, with pretty severe history of polyps and pretty severe history of GERD. We did an autoimmune protocol. We did a, a, a little bit of glutamine and a little bit of colostrum. Four weeks later, he came in, lost 10 pounds, no GERD, no, you know, and it was like, dude, you changed my life. And, and, it, yeah. and, and that's insane. <laughs> Be because we can argue against, the, you know, amongst each other about like the importance, you know, how important calories are. And then we like roll our eyes when people mention the importance of going gluten free, simple as that. But th there is a subset of people and the people that I'm seeing are the people that are sick, not the people that are trying to get an Instagram uh, account. Right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so Angie, I, I just ranted for two minutes and it, that was boring. Sorry. So let let's hear you talk. How would you explain autoimmune disease for someone that has no idea what autoimmune disease is? You know, the way that I would explain it is really basic. It is a case of mistaken identity where your body's cells that are meant to attack uh, a foreign invader have mistakenly identified some of your own cells as the foreign invader and started attacking you. And once your body learns how to do this, it does not learn how to undo it. 
but you can calm the process and you can reverse some of the damage that comes from that process through dietary and lifestyle shifts, you know, like with the autoimmune protocol. It's funny because when we talk about going into an autoimmune protocol or even paleo, you know, because it not everyone needs to go into the autoimmune protocol. Absolutely. Now, yeah. would everyone benefit from going to an autoimmune uh, protocol for like a month out of the year? Maybe. We don't know. But it's going to be a more hypoallergenic diet than just doing paleo. And, and, and this is what we've been doing for a very long time with things like Whole30 or with things of, you know, like getting uh, the paleo solution and going through the, pro uh, the protocol. It's just like the next step for someone that is sick. Now, we can make a laundry list of the things that can, that, that can be affected by your diet. And it almost sounds like, like we we're overselling this. Things like autoimmune disease of the thyroid, we can, we, we can heal the gut and, and uh, things like celiac disease, Lincoln planus, so things of your, uh, like your skin. And then there's conglomerate of autoimmune syndromes like lupus. Yep. And, and so, so when someone says, oh, you mean to tell me that by following this protocol, I can cure all of these things? And the answer is yes. Yeah, I mean, I've been really lucky. I run um, an online group program that I started in 2014. So this is my fifth year. I take several hundred people a year through the program. Uh, four to five times a year, I run it. I've had over 2,000 people go through that process, um, including the people that were part of the medical study you mentioned. And they have all different autoimmune diagnoses. You know, we have diagnoses like uh, rheumatoid arthritis. We have lots of people with Hashimoto's thyroiditis, uh, lots of people with different kinds of inflammatory bowel disease. You know, you name it. I've seen the diagnosis in my groups. And by and large, I would say usually 75%, if not more of them, move that needle in the right direction and experience positive changes in their quality of life and their disease progress. It's amazing. It, it works. It, it, it works. And again, you know, as a baseline, without having to run a, an IgG panel, if you come into my office and, and you have autoimmune disease, like, for example, uh, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, I'm probably going to suggest to take wheat off, to take dairy off, and to take eggs off as a baseline. And then get the IgG panel. Maybe uh, maybe after 30 days, you start feeling better. And maybe they, we can reintroduce eggs first and, and see how you feel. And then, uh, and then add other things. And, and if, if those three things, eliminating those three things don't work, then I, I send them to the autoimmune protocol. Okay, so how, how would you differentiate uh, the difference between the, the AIP and the regular paleo diet? AIP is like, like you said, like you were kind of alluding to earlier, we take things a little bit step further, we kind of go into this, um, this zone that's, you know, paleo is kind of like optimizing the health of those who are already basically healthy. They're, the, they're kind of like the look good naked people, right? <laughs> and AIP is like taking things a little bit further and going into a hypoallergenic realm. And we're about optimizing things for people who are not in good health. You know, our, our goal is healing. And we mean healing from a deep like cell level. So we take things a little bit further. You know, we eliminate all the grains, all the dairy, just like, uh, like paleo. We also um, take out all the legumes, all the nuts and seeds. That includes coffee and chocolate for anybody in your audience who's sad to hear that. Um, we, of course, eliminate alcohol um, we, and we eliminate eggs um, and the nightshade vegetables. So this is things like white potato, tomato, the hot and sweet peppers. You know, you were asking earlier part of the reason why, why was I so sick when I was in West Africa? Well, West Africa, you know, they eat a lot of tomatoes and a lot of hot peppers. And, you know, I was really inflaming my immune system doing that. Now, the important thing to know about the autoimmune protocol is that we don't just stay in that elimination phase you know, indefinitely. It's not meant to be this like life sentence where you never have chocolate or coffee again or, you know, enjoy eggs again or whatever, because some of the foods that we remove from the diet um, do have some nutritional benefit. The point is to calm the immune system down, rebalance the hormones, get the body really, we also add in a lot of very nutrient dense foods, things like organ meats, for instance, um, and seafood, things like that really feed the body really ultra nutrient rich foods while eliminating those trigger foods 
and then slowly start a reintroduction process so that they can go back to an individualized diet that is the least restrictive but produces their most health, their greatest health benefit. Um, it's not just elimination for the sake of elimination. So the question that people have in their minds listening to this is, so what do I eat? Yeah, <laughs> right. So there's lots of different kinds of proteins, lots of different kinds of meats that you can eat. It's not meant to be protein heavy, but we do encourage, uh, you know, normal servings of protein because those amino acids are so important to building the body, right? Um, we encourage lots and lots of veggies, like probably three quarters of your plate. You should be eating more vegetables than vegetarians by far. Um, a lot of the really, um, you know, kind of dense, starchy, carby vegetables are what you're going to replace um, your grains and stuff with. So you're, it's not meant to be a low carb diet either. I mean, it is obviously lower carbohydrate than the standard American diet, but it's not low carb. In you know, it's not like a keto approach. You sh should definitely be eating all those, um, you know, those veggies, the leafy greens, the sweet potatoes, the squashes, all those kinds of things. And then, of course, we focus on a lot of nutrient-dense ads. So we focus on adding organ meats. We focus on adding seafood. We um, focus on bringing in um, fermented foods like um, kombucha, sauerkraut, things like that, um, all the healthy fats. We really want you to uptake, uh, you know, have your uptake of fat be a lot greater. You know, this is like fat is kind of like a log on the internal fire. It keeps the blood sugar very even um, and it's important to hormones own health. So yeah, that's, that's how we do it. So what do you have for breakfast today? <laughs> Good question, right? Today for breakfast, I had um, a lamb sausage. I had blueberries, I had sauerkraut, and I had leftover sweet potatoes from last night. You know, and that's, that's the biggest thing that we think breakfast should be pancakes and eggs, or, you know, we have like this idea that breakfast should be a specific type of food. When people tell me that, I say, have you ever had breakfast for dinner? And then like, oh, yeah, I love doing that. Well, imagine having swap. dinner <laughs> for breakfast. Right. Swap. Swap. <laughs> you know, or I encourage um, a lot of my group members and clients to try um, really uh, delicious broths. Um, and soups for breakfast, you know, like a seafood soup for breakfast, something like that with a lot of vegetables in it. You know, we're kind of like soup for breakfast. And I always have to say, hey, listen, you know, most of the world outside of the United States is eating soup for breakfast and they're doing great. So you should try it. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, and it's just changing that that frame uh, of thought. You know, I'm pretty sure that that pre uh, everyone that's listening has had a an autoimmune approved uh, meal at least once in their life. Mm -hmm. It's just condensing them and having them over a period of time. It, that's that's the only thing you have to do. Now, uh, you know, a personal question: Have you have you been able to reintroduce some of the things that you excluded at the beginning? Yeah, definitely. So, you know, uh, my my blog partner, Mickey Trescott, you've had her on your show before. She and I have been uh, using the autoimmune protocol for probably going on six years now. Um, and so, yeah, I've definitely reintroduced a lot of foods since then. Um, you know, I've brought things like chocolate into my diet, occasionally coffee, occasionally alcohol. Um, I can do white potatoes, but I don't do very well with the rest of the nightshades, particularly like tomatoes and things like that. Um, peppers are not really, they don't really work for me. Um, I've found that over time. I have reintroduced some white rice into my diet, but I don't choose to bring in any of the other grains, obviously as a celiac, no gluten. I can do some dairy. Uh, you know, I, I try to kind of focus on high quality dairy and I do some of the nuts and seeds. So I have a really wide diet again. I have eggs again. You know, Yay. sometimes I have it. Yeah, sometimes I have eggs for breakfast. Um, I think the important thing for your audience to know probably is that if they get to like 90 days on the full elimination phase of the protocol and they still aren't having an improvement, um, that they kind of didn't move that baseline forward, then that's a sign that they need to be working with a healthcare practitioner, maybe somebody like you to do some further testing and, and figure out if there is something underlying that is preventing progress. You know, diet can be very powerful, but it can't fix everything. And sometimes we have underliers that need to be diagnosed and treated so that the diet can really do its job. 
And then beyond that point, you should definitely start to reintroduce foods. That's an important part of the protocol, just like the elimination was, because over time, there are important nutrients that you could be getting from some of those eliminated foods. And also it's psychologically and socially easier to sustain. And the opposite is also true. You know, you can come to me and, uh, with Hashimoto's thyroiditis and, you know, within a month, a month and a half, I can pretty much control your thyroid and get your TSH levels and, and reduce the inflammation and, and even reduce the, uh, the antibodies. And then people say, but I still feel like crap. Well, people with Hashimoto's also die in car crashes. People with Hashimoto's also have uh, accidents. Maybe Hashimoto's is a part of the right. reason that you're sick, maybe right. you need to go see someone like Angie and 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 uh, Mickey and get your nutrition in check. You know, it, it's it, it's it's a symbiotic relationship. Botanicals and and supplements and medications can take that six month journey down to three or two months, but you have been working at your disease process for 15, 20, 40, 50 years. It's going to take some time to regain your health. And that's what, you know, that's when people are like, are you kidding me? You know, when, when they come to see us and, and we we're like, okay, we're going to take eggs away and you're allowed to eat white rice. And they're like, what? <laughs> I thought <laughs> eggs were good and white rice was bad. And then 20 years ago, it was do not look at eggs. And then uh, and we need to eat brown rice. Can you tell us why white rice is good and why eggs could be bad? The the thing with eggs is that uh, in the lysosome, in the, in the white of the egg, um, there's this ability to kind of pull any bad thing that might be hanging out in your gut across the gut barrier, um, especially if your gut is at all leaky, which... Uh, all autoimmune disease has that in common, that our guts are a little, a little more open than they need to be. And 80% of our immune system is right on the other side of that gut lining, just kind of running right alongside that gut wall. And, and if the egg is kind of doing its, an awesome job of pulling things across, it's really activating that immune system. Um, and so this can really be a problem. And sometimes it's, you know, uh, proteins in the egg itself that are, that are causing the immune reaction. So it's kind of this combination of being able to pull anything negative that's hanging around in your gut across and, and present it to the immune system and, and also maybe the proteins itself. So taking them out for a while and discovering if that's a sensitivity that you have while you work to heal the gut can be really important. In terms of the white rice, you know, the, the rice is the seed of that plant. And they're really smart about their reproduction. And they have this covering on the outside of them that's meant to prevent um, a predator, uh, you know, any person that wants to eat it or any animal that wants to eat it from being able to digest it because this is its reproductive process. And white rice has had that outside covering removed. Brown rice still has the covering on. So you don't have to worry about it as much. It can be a little uh, dicey to be eating a lot of white rice if you have a lot of blood sugar issues. But if you prepare your rice with um, some fat, you know, maybe a little olive oil or some coconut oil and, you know, cook it in broth rather than water to kind of up the nutrient value a little bit. Um, for some people, it can be a really important add, both in terms of calories and also ease. Um, white rice is something that's very easy to eat when we're traveling, etc. Yeah, it's it's I I call them little clouds of uh, glucose, you know, and they're pretty right. they're they're right. they're they're very hypoallergenic, and, and that's a problem that people do make. They'll they'll say, oh, you know, I'm going gluten free because I want to lose weight. Well, gluten is a protein, and that kind of you know uh, it slows the absorption of sugar. So when you take away the protein from your bread, that the glycemic index in your bread is gonna go up. So yeah, it is more hypoallergenic but it has an effect on your sugar that is faster than uh, whole wheat bread. Yeah, I would say people people want to be slow to reintroduce rice. They are pretty sure that their blood sugar is in a good a good place, you know, real well balanced. Make sure they're eating it with protein and everything, you know, don't just make meals of white rice by itself. <laughs> yeah, and and you you have to pick your poison, you know, do you want to be a hypoallergenic? Or do you want to have something that's inflammatory but has maybe, you know, and, and, or things like milk. 
The problem with milk, because I do get patients that are like, oh no, I have my 23 and me and I'm not lactose intolerant. Well, lactose is a sugar and that, that sugar, you know, can feed your bad bacteria and then, and then you can get gas. But there's also casein, whey, albumin. There's all of these different things that you could be allergic to. And, and that's why milk can be tricky because it has, you know, you, you know, you can be allergic to just the casein part. And you think, oh, I'm, I'm buying lactose-free milk. Well, okay, the lactose is gone, but you still have to deal with the casein. So it gets tricky. And by simplifying the process like you, ha- you guys have done, it makes it so much easier to have these uh, guidelines that if you do it you know, with a support group, which is what you guys are doing, and, and you're sharing your recipes and you're sharing your, your, um, your journey, it's going to be so much easier to achieve that health. So how long uh, is your your program when you do your online uh, groups? So we take six weeks and another really, you know, you were talking about having the sharing the journey and sharing uh, recipes and ideas with each other. Obviously, that's a really important component. The other big thing that I do in my group program is we take out two food groups a week over the six week process. So we start with week one and we don't even remove a food. During week one, all we do is plan and prepare. We learn about the process we're gonna go through and we set ourselves up for success so that we're ready to go You know, a week later when we start. And then we just remove two food groups a week over the, the following five weeks and kind of a, arrive at the full elimination of autoimmune protocol, arrive at that full phase um, in a more gentle way, which is a lot easier for most people to adopt. A lot of us want to be those kind of cold turkey people who can adopt a whole new habit overnight. But the truth is when you make a dietary change this big, um, it's going to have a whole life impact and you need time to kind of put that process together and set yourself up for success. And the good news is the medical study proved the benefits still happen very rapidly. You know, in the medical study, we had 73% of the folks in the study who all had inflammatory bowel disease. We had them in clinical remission by week six. Monday of week six is only the first day that they are fully in the elimination phase. That means that some of those participants were already reaching clinical remission. So the the changes are still really positive and can still happen really fast, but it's less stressful. <laughs> so let's 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 dig d- deeper into this study. I have two questions, and then I'm gonna go back. What is the first group that you eliminate? Because I imagine that if like the first week is going to be like your preparation, what is the first thing that you uh, that you eliminate? Because I in my you know, tiny brain, I think maybe this is what they believe to be the most inflammatory thing. And then second, uh, let's talk about the, the, uh, the group and, and, and can you describe that, that, uh, that study and, and what you guys did? Sure, sure. So you're, you're, you're totally on to me, Garamo. You totally know what, what we're, our thinking is. So when you reintroduce foods after you've been on the autoimmune protocol, you introduce them in stages. And the stages start with the foods that are the most nutrient dense and the least likely to cause a sensitivity reaction. So when I take the foods out to get people into elimination, I do exactly the opposite. I take out the foods that are the most likely to cause a reaction and the least nutrient dense foods first. So we start with all the grains and alcohol. Ah. Yeah. And from there, we move slowly, um, trying to kind of focus on the things that are least likely to be causing a problem and still have some nutritional value. We wait till the end before we're taking them out. Um, so yeah, it's, it, they get a lot of bang for their buck right away. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 th- and that's, and, you know, and, uh, it, it just sucks. Because there's a physiological problem and it's not your fault that you can't eat wheat. You know, it's, it, and, it, and it breaks my heart when I have, you know, a kiddo or, or I have someone that is like, but I've been eating grains because they're at the base of the, of the food pyramid. And, and it's, I'm like, it's not your fault. You know, it's nothing you did. It's the cards that you were dealt. And, and maybe some grains can come back. But maybe some grains won't be able to come back. One more question before we go into the study. For food allergy testing, okay, do you guys use any, do you see any value? And uh, what are the advantages of doing something blindly, you know, in quotation marks, um, as an elimination diet 
uh, hint for my people listening, that's the gold standard over doing like a food allergy panel. You know, the thing about the food allergy panels is that I know that, that there are lots of practitioners out there who really believe that there's a lot of benefit in them. And I, I won't say that there are is no benefit, but I don't think that our science is quite as uh, delicate and accurate as we want it to be yet. Um, and so what ends up happening for a lot of the people that I see is that what their food allergy panel revealed is that their gut is leaky. That's it. That, that, you that's know, it. it showed... Yeah, it showed it shows that they have a lot of, uh, you know, antibodies kind of running around out there that are just a, basically a reflection of all the foods they've recently eating that are leaking across their gut. Um, they may not really be reflecting true, true sensitivities. Whereas when you go through an elimination and reintroduction process, this is really gold standard. You remove the food. You then get to a good baseline where your health is in good shape and you have kind of a clean slate from which to judge. And then you start to bring those foods back. I, I tell people that it's kind of like the analogy is kind of like you're in a bar that's very loud and noisy, lots of music and people talking and you're yelling at your friend and the music stops. And everybody suddenly can hear you yelling. This is kind of what you do with a reintroduction and elimination di diet. You remove all these foods and you quiet the noise in your body. And then when you try to bring in a food that you're potentially sensitive to, it's a big reaction and you can clearly hear your body and you clearly know what that reaction was associated with. There's a lot of information out on the internet. So I do offer a food allergy panel because there's people that come into my office. They want to know their food allergies. And the last thing I want to do is for someone to be coming into my office and then asking me for something and then me like, actually, you're wrong about this. No, I want yeah. to give you I want to give you the information that you want, because, I, you know, I'm not the boss. You are the boss. I do explain that the most important thing about a food allergy panel is the possibility of leaky gut. But I have a gut feeling, no pun intended, that innately or or naturally why would you be allergic to string beans or why would right. you be allergic to cumin or you know like or like or something random like that you know it, it makes more sense in my head that you have some sort of you know uh, intestinal permeability what is the underlying cause and maybe maybe that cumin is does is setting you off and and that's what's making you react but by healing the gut, then you're going to have way more latitude and maybe you can have a taco every once in a while and you won't, right. and you won't be either, you know, uh, with chronic fatigue or, or with mental fog for a month or in the bathroom for a month, you know? So that's how I use a food allergy panel rather than, okay, these three things you can never look at ever again, you know, and, <laughs> and, and, and then, and then things like wheat that maybe didn't, didn't, uh, light up. Then I'm like, oh, well, but but guess what? You can eat wheat as much as you want. No, that's not how I look at a at food allergy panel. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, that's that's my thoughts too. So, okay, so let's get into the study. How did sure. you guys design the study? What was involved? And, and then how did you convince someone to put a, a spotlight in this, uh, in this pseudoscience, LOL? <laughs> Uh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, we were really lucky. So in in late 2015, uh, roughly, you know, around Christmas time of 2015, Mickey and I were contacted by Dr. Gori Kanajedi um, at Scripps Clinic in San Diego. And she reached out to us through our blog and asked if she could uh, have a call with us. And we got on the call with her and she told us that she had a patient with ulcerative colitis, pretty severe case. Um, and he had come to her some months before, and he said that he wanted to give the autoimmune protocol a, a chance. He wanted to try the AIP diet. And she agreed to let him try it, but told him, if this doesn't work, you know, I'll give you three months. If this doesn't work, we need to start you on some biologic drugs because, you know, you, the disease is, is progressing and you're kind of in bad shape. And she had done a bunch of imaging and tests beforehand, so she knew how active and serious his disease was. He adopted AIP. He came back three months later. She did the imaging and reran the tests, and he was in remission. And she was so shocked um, that she decided she wanted to look into this protocol more and find out what what was all you know what was all involved and how did this work. 
So she asked him where he found his information and he pointed her to our website. So she came to the website. She was poking around for a while, learning about the autoimmune protocol. She saw that I run a group program helping people adopt the diet. And she decided she wanted to study this diet for her inflammatory bowel disease patients. She's a gastroenterologist and she's a researcher. And so she contacted us and she said that she wanted to partner with me and use my program to onboard the participants in the study into the autoimmune protocol and uh, have me act as the health coach that's helping teach them how to do this while she runs the medical side, all the testing, imaging, you know, that kind of follow up. Um, of course, I said, absolutely. Like, <laughs> what more? What can I do for you? I would happily do anything for you. Um, this is an awesome opportunity. So she started working on funding. Um, by fall of 2016, she had her funding put together and she uh, found 15 uh, patients with either ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease. They had an average of 20 years of disease history. So it's not like these were just like newly diagnosed. They've only been sick for a few months. These people were very ill and had had the disease for a long time. Um, most of them came into the study on biologic drugs, but despite the fact that they were on the drugs, they were not in remission. They were still having trouble with the diseases. So uh, we started the process. I, I got another health coach involved who has IBD herself because I wanted my um, participants to be able to relate. Um, I brought a registered dietitian on board because, you know, it's outside of my scope of practice to make changes um, in terms of their you know, any medical intervention. So the RD helped us with that. And the doctor did testing all along the way while the patients went through the process um, of switching their diet. And like I said, by week six, 73% uh, of them, 11 of the 15 were in clinical remission. Some of the, that 11 were able to discontinue their biologic drugs. And uh, we went for five more weeks and they all remained in remission while we went through the maintenance period. So are this with the patients that, that uh, the doctor found, did they have like paleo habits or were they like, okay, guys, sit down. I'm about to drop a bucket of cold water over your head. Right. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, he had, uh, we had one male participant who had heard of paleo, but uh, he he didn't follow a paleo diet. Um, most of, the, we had quite a few participants who were older, some of them in their 60s and 70s. Um, so they, th this was definitely a brand new approach to eating as far as they were concerned. Uh, we had one participant who worked at a bakery. Uh, <laughs> this is a really big change, right? Really big, huge uh, process. So yeah, these were really really like, for the most part, typical standard American diet uh, folks, you know, this was a really big change for them. But we just put all the support around them that I normally put around people and they went for it and they they had amazing results. You know, I would, it, it makes me sad, you know, that imagine having a disease like this for 20 years and then all of a sudden in six weeks, someone tells you everything you've learned it's completely wrong and they turn your world upside down. Have you ever had that conversation? Because I've, I have, I've had it with my patients and they, they get, they get so excited that they're getting better. And then they get kind of like a little sad that how come no one ever told me this before? What's your answer to that question? Yeah. You know, usually my answer to them is first of all, um, a, a lot of the clients and group members that I have go through a little bit of period of anger about that. Yes. <laughs> um, and I, I tell them, first of all, it's okay to be angry about that. We were given a lot of misinformation. And for you, you have a particular set of genetics. That wrong information turned into a very serious life consequence for you. You know, you have a disease now. And it's okay to be angry about that for a while and just feel that emotion and then the next step, though, is to use that anger to fuel something positive. Now you make a big change in your life. You serve as an example to the people around you that this can be done and that you can be empowered to do something to move the needle for your own health. Um, and, and you tell others about how to do it. There's 55 million of us in the United States with autoimmune disease alone. And if you tell two people, we are gonna ch we're going to turn the tide. Going and, you know, sharing this podcast or making your own podcast or, you know, or making your own support group, you know, it, that's, that's how we change the world. 
Right. That's the ripple effect. And, um, you know, when Mickey and I began six years ago, we Mickey and I, along with three other women, one of them being Dr. Sarah Ballantyne, the, you know, kind of the refiner uh, of the autoimmune protocol as it stands today. We were like the only people that we could find who were doing this and talking about it online through our blogs and social media. And we felt like a very kind of fringe and weird group of people who were trying this crazy thing. But now today, um, there are millions. There are millions all over the globe that are doing it. And that only took six years. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and I'm telling you, you know, it's like I have different, I have a spectrum, you know, and I want to have my patients in the, in the widest diet that they can eat. So, so like my first, my first suggestion, you know, if you have autoimmune disease, I just take those three things out and then I see how you're following. And there's people that they don't need to take anything out, you know, yeah, that's all that they needed. Yep. That's all they needed. You know, they, they, they can, you know, as soon as we, we get their, you know, their sleep in on in control and we get their thyroid medication under control and then we heal the gut and then we yep. get them pooping and right th 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 you know they can have a beer and pizza every once in a while and then they start crushing it at crossfit and and they are like what else can i do to even be more superhuman unfortunately of the people who are coming to see me that's that's a small percentage the big percentage of the people that I see, they don't have to do a, an autoimmune paleo protocol, but like cleaning their diet and and uh, and being like 95% clean and 5% clean is going to be enough. And they start noticing when they mess up. So they stay more in the 99%. And then I have like, you know, a subset of people that they have to be really fastidious with their food. And it's nothing they did. And it's nothing, you know, it's not their fault. But if we get those wheels turning, all of a sudden they start getting better and they start feeling better and it's not a chore. And then eventually as you gain health, then you can start reintroducing some other things and, and we change your, uh, your gut flora and we, and we get your lifestyle in check and then you start getting better and then you might be able to reintroduce more things, but it's not your fault. Yeah. It's not, it's not, it's not your fault. You know, and I, I think, um, you know, like we talked about earlier, uh, t undertaking a dietary shift like this for healing um, is really big. It usually impacts a person's whole life. Um, and I tell them, you know, it's okay to be angry in the beginning. And it's also okay to go through a period of mourning a little bit because you, you, you've really lost some probably big and important parts of your life as you've had to shift your diet. Um, that said, the next important step is to move out of those emotions and into the positive ones and kind of reframe. And, and enjoying the health because if you're right. miserable but you feel great and you're miserable because you, no one diagnosed that's you. That's not the point. Yeah. That's not the point. So <laughs> yeah. what, are, what, are, what are some autoimmune paleo habits that, that you see people missing out? You know, because the diet is easy and kind of intuitive. You know, uh, oh, you know, uh, you know, uh, I'm going to eliminate these things because they're inflammatory to reduce my inflammation. What are some lifestyle habits, you know, like one that comes to mind is cooking. I imagine that a lot of people are like, don't know how to cook and you and that's a big one. But are there any like weird ones that you're like, you know what, this really made a difference for me. And this is something that people are not talking about. Yeah, you know, we in my program, not only do we week by week, uh, you know, take out some foods and add some nutrient dense foods, but we also try to give a little bit of time to focusing on some kind of lifestyle habit that will also be helpful for them, maybe improving their sleep, maybe um, changing how they handle their exercise, their movement, um, working on stress management. And one thing I see when it comes to stress management um, is how powerful reframing is. I feel like in my own personal story, the biggest needle mover was reframing how I thought about my journey, how I thought about my diseases, um, how I thought about dietary change itself. In the beginning, I definitely did not view my diseases as gifts. And I'm not saying that at any point anyone has to, you know, be like, oh, you know, my celiac disease is my best friend. <laughs> you know, I mean, you're, pro that you're probably not going to come to that point. Any of us, if we could have the choice to not have these diseases, I'm sure we would choose to not have the disease. 
but I found it really powerful over time to start recognizing the things I was gaining in my life because of that disease um, and reframing it that way. You know, Malcolm Gladwell, the writer, he talks about this being um, the advantage of a disadvantage. And I think that um, practicing that, you know, and it's not just my personality. I wasn't just not naturally born with the ability to see the the, the positive light in these things and, and reframe in this way. I, it was really a skill. I had to practice that. But it really changed everything. Um, it really made a big difference. Two things come to mind. When, when I was shadowing Dr. Alan Christensen, I remember having a, a patient, you know, and... Uh, and the patient was like, you know, I, they put me on this biological and I failed. And he stopped the conversation. And he's like, no, the medicine failed you. Yes. <laughs> you did not fail the medicine. And and that was like a big, you know, uh, shift in my head. And then uh, the second thing is that when you do have like something like celiac disease that hurts you when you eat this inflammatory grain, then uh, you kind of... Uh, have the advantage of never wanting to eat it again because it hurts and it's easier to leave something that hurts you you know like oh, oh you know uh, i had a little uh, some pizza and now i'm running to the bathroom every 20 minutes and you can make that connection really easily so like for me in my personal case i don't touch gluten i've never been diagnosed with celiac but i know that if i have like a pretty good exposure I will get like intestinal symptoms that hurt, you know, with milk, I get a zit or something like that. And, and that doesn't bother me that much. So I know it's doing something bad to my system. So I am so glad that I'm super allergic to wheat or that I react, you know, to wheat because I, I it's easier for me to stay away from it than from milk products and and I know they're causing and it maybe maybe in the future you know when I grow up I'll I'll stop drinking milk or dr dairy but it really doesn't hurt me that much so I still do it and it's probably not the best for me so it is a gift sometimes and 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 then you talked about like mental shifts well you know we do see that people with celiac disease tend to have a little bit more symptoms of depression and then you know and that could be seen as a ne you know as a negative thinking so you eliminate wheat you eliminate that and now you have not only the ability of apply what you've learned about reframing but you don't have the physiological stressor that is not letting you apply those things so you know it's it's a twofold yes yes totally so angie you know Thank you so much for this interview. You have been nothing but amazing. Uh, I really, you know, I really want to uh, to yell this out of the mountaintops because uh, there's there are people that are frustrated because they're jumping from one, uh, you know, from one diet to another. You know, they're and 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 they oh, I'm gonna juice fast for 30 days and then they feel like crap. Oh, I'm gonna try you know paleo for 30 days and they feel like crap. And I think the the autoimmune paleo protocol is to me the most hypoallergenic diet, and it's applicable to everyone in the population. And thank you for doing your work. And let's get everyone that's sick, you know, as a baseline. You know, if you can't fly to Arizona to see me, do the, the, the you know the the autoimmune paleo protocol first. Maybe you won't need to. So thank you for your work. Where can people find some information? Where can people sign up for your group? Where can people find some recipes? So uh, like I said, I blog um, with my partner, Mickey Truscott at autoimmunewellness.com. Um, we also run a seasonal podcast called the Autoimmune Wellness Podcast. We're, we're releasing season three right now. Um, folks can, yeah, folks can find the podcast and all of our blog articles and um, lots of recipes. I don't know. We have, I don't know, two or 300 recipes on there. All of them um, elimination phase compliant for the autoimmune protocol. Um, they can find our books and everything there at the website. Um, if folks are interested in my group program, the next enrollment opens on June 1st for uh, the July start of the groups, and they can find that at sad, S-A-D, 2, T-O-A-I-P.com, sad to A-I-P.com. That's awesome. Yeah, um, and they, so they can find the program there. Um, 
you know, we're on Facebook at Autoimmune Wellness. Um, and my Instagram is Angie.alt if they want to come check me out on Instagram. Awesome. See all those uh, uh, beautiful breakfasts and lunches and dinners. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, 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 you know, it's it's so funny that we sometimes want to make every picture, every, every meal Instagram ready. It's not worth it. <laughs> They might be dis- they might be disappointed by mine. I'm a very re- I'm a very real life person. <laughs> and, and and that's and that's a skill that you know that people that are new into this community should learn really fast. You know that yeah. your food yeah. is gonna look not Instagram ready ninety nine percent. Yeah, and that's totally fine. You're doing it right. <laughs> yeah, you are doing you. Are, in fact, if you're spending too much time, you know, go spend time in the sun instead or something. Right. Like that. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much. This has been amazing, and I'll talk to you soon.